this. If you hear this title, you may think about, okay, maybe I'm always studying like labor market outcomes, like why and how workers or individuals choose to choose where to work. How many hours to work? In, instead, uh, labor economists study a lot of topics, right? Okay, for example, like crime. Okay, why and how individuals or uh, people commit crime? Okay, crime, education, gender, gender inequality is what I'm particularly interested in. Okay, and I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction about myself and what I'm doing. And because, like I said, we are going to have more than like two hours, and it's not possible for me to keep on talking and clock talking. Okay, I'm going to divide our lecture into like two parts. We are going to have basically two mini lecture. And the so first one is going to start uh, last from 9 to 10 a.m. Okay, lecture one. And then we are going to have like 20 minute short break. If you have any questions, you can just ask me, okay? During the break or during the lecture. I like being interrupted, okay? You can just stop me, raise, uh, you can just stop me, ask your questions, you can raise your hand. If you are not feeling comfortable to interrupt me, just uh, raise your hand. Okay, if I see your hand, I will ask. I will ask you to to talk. Okay, and uh, we're going to have twenty minutes short break, and then we're going to have the second lecture. And uh, after these two mini lectures, we are going to have like a fifteen minute close book quiz. It's going to be a multiple choice questions. Very simple. Okay, all you need to do is just pay attention to the lectures and ask the questions whenever you have. And I think you should be fine, okay? And uh, so this is my plan about today's lecture. So in terms of the, uh, of course, so for the outlines, the last part of the outline topics that will be covered, because the title of today's topic is how to do economics research, right? So I'm going to basically provide you a recipe to show you like how economists follows the recipe to do the research. I'm going to tell you what's the purpose of doing research and why we think doing research is so important, right? I mean, doing research, working as a professor is my career, is our career, okay? And what's the purpose of uh, working as a professor? So I'm going to provide you a recipe. For example, I'm going to tell in the topics that will be covered, I'm going to talk about like the how to find a good research question. How to ask a question, a good research question. Uh, it, I think it's the most important task or the skill. Uh, every student or every good economist need to have, okay? Asking a good question is a very important and a good starting point to do the research. If you are ever thinking about becoming an, an economist, Okay, how to ask a good, good, good research question, or how to ask a good question. That's the first part. The second part is how to use, what kind of methods we, we usually use to answer the question, okay? When you have, when you read the question, and uh, if you can convince people believe you that the question is so important, okay? And for example, like a typical question is, what's the impact of previous or last year's crime rates on this year's crime rates, okay? Is there any correlation or causal relationship between last year in a specific city, okay? Last year's crime rates or this year's crime rates. So intuitively, we may think of, oh, there should be some correlation, right? For any city, if last year there are so many like robberies, um, these kind of criminal activities, maybe this year there should be more like uh, this kind of criminal activities in other safe, uh, compared to other safe cities. But in fact, this, of course, so first of all, this is a good question, okay, research question, but it's very difficult to answer. And there is a lot of debate about answering, about the answer to this type of question, okay? And if you, after you read the good research questions, the next step is you need to convince people to believe your answer. 
either you believe, okay, there is correlation. There is some correlation between last year's criminal activity and this year's criminal activity. You need to convince people to believe your story, right? Tell me your evidence. So basically, I'm going to give you some brief guidance about how to convince people. What kind of evidence people would like to believe? Okay, I mean today's economies also, or economics research also is still social science. But people would rather believe in the data. Okay, data evidence, quantitative analysis instead of just some qualitative. Oh, based on the logic, based on the reasoning, that's not enough. Okay, we need to provide data. We need to show statistics to convince people. Okay, so that's basically the topic I'm going to cover. So first of all, about me, I got my PhD in economics from the University of Houston in 2018. That's almost five, six years ago. Okay, and uh, before I went to US, I already had uh, my master degree. Okay, uh, from Sun University in China, which is located in Guangdong province. And I spent six years in graduate school. Okay, before, like I said, before that, I've got a master degree. And uh, so, typically these days, if you want to become an economist, either working in a, for example, Fed, or working in a like, top industry, top firm like Amazon, I mean, Amazon is also hiring a lot of economists these days, every year, okay? And uh, also, so Amazon, or if you want to consider working as an economist for the government, for the census, for the Fed, or working as an economist in the university, you need to have a PhD degree in economics, okay? You need to have a PhD degree. And typically, these, these days, you need to spend at least six years in graduate school, okay, to get a PhD degree. And I think these days, people even spend much longer, six, seven, or eight years to get a PhD. Why? Because it's extremely difficult to produce a good PhD dissertation. Dissertation means writing a paper, writing a research paper, okay. That's the output of a page, what you should do in, uh, in, in graduate school, okay? So six, at least the six years, six to seven years training in the graduate school, okay? Getting the PhD degree. And uh, so my research area is labor eco economics, behavior and experimental eco economics, Chinese economy, and uh, I'm particularly interested in gender inequality. So the interesting thing is, before I went to US, I was really good at macro macroeconomics, and I was determined to become a macroeconomist. But what's the difference between macro and labor? I mean, labor economics, behavior, experimental economics, these are all what we, what we call applied economics, okay? Applied on microeconomics, very different from macro. What, map, what do macroeconomists do? They study GDP growth, structural transformation, for example, how China transformed from an agriculture dominant economy to a, like today, manufacturing dominant economy, and the inflation, okay? And then, like before I went to US, but then I changed my mind. I'm, when I went to graduate school, when I'm doing my PhD, okay, I, then I realized, yeah, I mean, studying macroeconomics, studying macroeconomics means just uh, reading the textbook, memorizing those facts, is very different from doing research, okay? When I say, when I say doing research, I really mean you need to produce no, new knowledge, okay? We are producing new knowledge. We are trying to figure out what people don't know, okay? New rules, new knowledge, and the new findings. New, we need to use new data, okay? That's completely different from what we are, uh, as students, what we do before the PhD, okay? Before PhD, usually what we did is just reading the textbook, 
Reading the textbook means we are just taking whatever the existing knowledge as given, right? Existing knowledge as given. But yeah, then I realized, okay, I can only contrib do my contribution to the labor economics. So let us say, what do labor economists do? What we usually do is we are particularly interested, generally, we are particularly interested in understanding how the wage is determined. So the motivation is, think about this, okay, imagine, in the economy, right? And uh, there are so many individuals, they have higher wages than others, right? And uh, why? What's the reason? Okay, why some individuals can earn higher wages than others? A typical example is, I focus on gender. Gender, gender inequality, of course, this, this is, it's a central topic of economics research, okay? The very interesting thing is, let's imagine, think about this, okay? This is, if we just uh, look at two groups of workers or individuals, one group is female, the other group is male. Even if this group of female males, they have the same level of education, same age, and let's just say everything is almost the same, okay, family background. But still, these days, if you look at across the world, across different countries, for every $100 earned by men, women can only earn about $70 to $80. The gender wage gap persists about 10 to 20 percent. It's always true across different countries, across different time periods, even though the gender inequality has decreased. Okay, so this becomes a very interesting like, puzzle to all the labor economies. We really want to understand why, okay? Even though, especially if you think about today's like higher education attainment, in fact, in US, also in China, okay, if you look at China, so in universities, I don't know whether you pay attention, we, we already have more girls than boys, okay? In terms of the at, attending the college degree, women or girls are more, already more educated than men. The problem is once they leave the schools, once they go to the society, once they start working, once they get married, and after, like, especially after childbirth, okay, then females start to leave the labor market, okay, start to leave the labor market, and also if you look at the level, different level of the professors in different schools, so, I mean, when you graduate, if you want to work as an economic professor in universities, you will start as the assistant professor, okay, that's what, what I was doing. I was doing uh, about five, six years ago. Now I'm associated. I got promoted. Assistant, uh, associate, and a floor professor. And if you pay attention, looking around uh, across the whole world, okay, for is it, there is a consistent systematic pattern, okay? We have less and less female associate professors and then floor professors. And why? What's the reason? And the story is not just about discrimination. Okay, discrimination is the standard, uh, uh, typical explanation. Okay, but the real reason or the real life is much more complicated than that. Right? We have gender norm, we have culture, we have like females bear more family responsibilities. All these are very important, and interesting, like phenomena or puzzles or questions to explore. Okay. So I'm a, now I'm a purely applied microeconomist. So what is applied microeconomist? We rely on data to prove our, or to answer our research question, okay? In the future, when you hear that people tell you, oh, I'm an applied microeconomist, you should know this person or this guy or this economist, he or she uses a lot of data, okay? And um, data, I mean, is a very important uh, resources these days, okay? Data, when I say data, I'm not just talking about like 100, uh, ser serving 100 workers, or I'm talking about census, the whole population, okay? For example, so some, some papers, econo or some economic research even use the whole country's, every individual's 
data to answer the recent question. Okay, for example, like in Netherlands, etc. So applied microeconomics mean suggests this person relies on data to prove or disprove whatever the question he is interested in. Okay. So yeah, this is what I just said. So for the but I mean yeah, uh, if you want to become an econ professor, you need to get have a PhD degree in economics. But for bachelor degree, you don't have to be necessary. You have to come from the econ major, right? Economics, math, engineering, sociology, blah blah. And they, all these majors, um, um, you know, with this background, you can pursue the PhD degree in economics. Okay. The key here is. You need to take, that's my suggestion, okay? Key is to take as many math courses as possible, okay? Like I said, even though economics is social science today, but we typically, people will say, we are the most close social science to the nature science, okay? We rely on very strict mathematical tools, strict quantitative models, models, data science, data analysis tools to answer research questions. So I would suggest you to take as many courses as possible, okay? And uh, try to get yourself exposed to research, for example, like what you are doing here. Right? Attending some school, because you are so young, right? Just give yourself a lot of opportunities to explore all the possibilities, right? To see whether you are really interested in um, in the doing research. Working, when you go to a um, college, you can try to work as a researcher. Just propose, okay, volunteer to work a research assistant for econ professors. Try to accumulate uh, as much as uh, research experience as possible, okay? Then, it, I think it, it will be good for you to make a decision whether you really want to do research. Because doing research, this is a lifetime career. It's not just some. It's not just about interest. Okay. Of course, the starting point is always about our curiosity and our interest about the social and economic phenomena. But it's a really lifetime career. Okay. And of course, working as an econ professor means my work time is quite flexible. Okay. And I don't teach. I don't teach every day. Right? And I have my teaching load, maybe two courses each semester. But working work time is flexible. It also, also means it also means you need to work every day. Okay? Basically doing research is like I said, means you need to really think hard about how to answer the research question, how to make output. Nobody is pushing you, okay? And um, what we are doing every day is we produce research papers. Okay, research papers is how we prove our value. Okay, produce research papers, try to get them published. Why? Because only if your paper, our paper, can be published, the people will read it. Okay, this is how we influence the government, how we influence the society. Okay, we use our work, the paper. To influence the policymakers, the society, try to change people's attitudes, behaviors. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, what do we? Uh, I keep talking about doing research. So, what do I mean by doing research? Like I said, doing research is not memorizing the whatever that exists in the, in the textbook. Okay, it's not really about uh, memorizing things, memorizing those knowledge, existing knowledge. It's really about producing new knowledge, which is so difficult. Okay, so almost uh, most of professors will say there is a little correlation between the Good, te good uh, te test takers and a good economist. Okay, so don't confuse yourself. Like, 
So if one case is some before I already met, or some students thought that I'm really good at taking tests. Okay, maybe especially in college, if I'm good in a good at taking tests, I may become a good economist, and uh, that's completely wrong. Okay. Also, the other case is if you are not good at taking tests, it does not necessarily mean you cannot become a good economist. Okay. There is almost a zero or we say negligible correlation between these two things okay and uh, so what determines uh, uh, you to become a good uh, economist first of course like i said interest why like i said the doing good the starting point of doing good research is about asking a good question okay and the thing about this if you are not curious about anything, okay, for example, because I'm curious about why females are disproportionately leaving the labor market after they getting married, after they having birth. This is some phenomenon I'm really interested in because I'm curious. This is really a very important starting point. You have to show your curiosity for at least one phenomenon or puzzle, whatever, okay? And uh, you need to have interest, but interest itself does not enough, does not, uh, does not provide like enough condition for you to become a, a good economist, okay? You need to have passion. You need to work really, really hard, especially during the period in the graduate school. I really, we usually work eight or 10 hours each day. Okay, six days per week. This is how we can become, um, we graduate and become an income professor. And also you need a rigorous training. Okay, this is what I said. At least, uh, not just five, I don't think five years is enough. It's even enough today. Six, seven years of PhD training. Okay, so any questions up until now? Yeah, hopefully I'm, yeah. Let me know if you have any questions, okay? Because I, I don't, uh, have a clear idea about your background. So I don't know, like, for example, how fast I should go, whether I go too fast or too slow. Just <coughs> slow me, okay? When, whenever you have any questions or whenever I'm working my, making myself clear. Okay, so yeah, basically that's the short introduction. Now, let's take a look at the overview, what I'm going to share with you. First, I'm going to discuss the idea. So when I say the idea, I mean the question. Okay. A research paper is about answering a research question. And we need to answer a correct, a good research question. Okay. I'm just going to briefly discuss where is your idea coming from. And after we raise the question, we need to find the correct data to answer our question. Okay. Where is your data coming from? Okay. When we have the data, we need to have some reliable method and then we use the method we use the data to apply to the data to answer our question why do we need to have reliable method because eventually think about this we need to get our work paper to publish right in order to get the paper to be published what kind of paper can be published those papers that can be people can be trusted People believe your story. If readers believe your story, if readers are convinced by your story, uh, editors, referees, if they believe your story, they will publish your paper, right? Only if we can get our paper published, published, we can influence the world, okay? And uh, what do you have in your tool uh, key box? And this is a method. Of course, today I'm not going to focus on the method because you are going to, when you go to college, you are going to learn kinds of method, mathematical method, okay? And statistical method, etc. the matrix method. And then I'm going to briefly summarize the steps to come up with a complete research proposal, okay? Just want to give you some guidance about what's the correct uh, research proposal we are expecting. Okay, so let me folks, let me go to the, uh, the point. So what's the goal of doing research? In the short run, 
in the short run, I mean, in the long run, of course, the goal of, the, the goal of doing research is we would like to contribute to the existing knowledge. We would like to influence the society, right? That's in the long run or the big goal. But in the short run, our goal of doing research is we want to write a research paper, get it published, okay? And uh, you will, as economists like me, I am judged by my paper, okay? Know my appearance, know my family background. People know me only because I write papers. My papers get published. Okay, people believe no. People believe me because they believe in my story, believe in my research. You'll be judged by your paper, and how hard it is to uh, get, to write a research paper to get it published. I just give you one statistic. Okay. On average, these days, for a good research paper, econ research paper to get published, it takes at least three years. At least three years. Okay. When I say three years, it means the day when you start, uh, when you already have a good research question. Okay. That's as even uh, even already quite hard. But when I say three years, I mean today I already have a good research question. I already have the data, okay? I know it's plausible, it's practical to answer my research question by using this data, okay? Then I start doing the data analysis, writing the model, why well, have the results? Why well, results means I have the evidence to support my, to answer or to support my question. Then I write the paper, then I go around the world. I talk to people, okay? I talk to senior scholars, ask the feedback, ask the comments on how to revise my paper. That's a, basically that's the process, okay? To revise my paper and then I polish it and then send it to journal. I send it to journal and uh, probably for the first time I may be rejected. Okay, I reject, get rejected uh, for two or three times, and then eventually, and uh, I'm lucky, and my paper will, uh, will be sent to the outside reviewer, anonymous reviewer, and uh, they will give me additional feedback, and I need to revise, revise again. Okay, that's the whole process, and uh, at least three years. Okay, I often, if you talk to different professors, ask, just ask them, how long does for example, I know in other classes they may already discuss a lot of their own paper. You can ask them like, how long did it take you to like write this paper get published? Probably they will tell you, oh, I started this paper maybe like five or six years ago or ten years ago. Okay, that's uh, that's normal. And also the acceptance rate for these journals. These are the top journals in economics. Okay, I think. It, just have a brief idea of what this journal is. Okay, the acceptance rate is less than one or two percent on average. One or two percent. Like for every one hundred papers submitted to here, like one or two will be eventually accepted. Okay, the acceptance rate is is very low. But of course, if for economists, if your paper can be published here, which means yeah, you are going to make big influence. Okay, huge influence in the academia and in your school and in the society. So in the future, I mean, I forgot to mention, basically every economist has our own website. Okay, you just even Google, Google my name, Sharon Shijin Zuo Fuda, and you'll find my personal website. Just check each professor's publication. Okay, if you see this journal's name, American Economic Review, Quarterly Journal of Economics, Journal of Political Economy, the Review of Economic Studies, Econometrica. Then basically, this is a very strong signal, okay? Very strong signal uh, for these professors to be a, like excellent, extremely excellent professors, okay? Of course, yeah, it's, it's extremely hard to, to publish papers here, and then it's, it's my goal. Yeah, I'm still working on it. Okay, these are the Journals, how does it look like? The AER, QGE, Econ Studies. So, for so example, like the QGE, QGE means it's published quarterly, right? And uh, so every journal only has, as you can see, limited uh, papers, like 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten papers. Each quarter, each quarterly publish this one edition. And uh, very limited papers can show up here. Uh, I mean, these are the most reference, most important reference for us to read. Okay, I read each edition, and uh, this is how I know the frontier of the research. This is how I know what people care. Okay, if I mean, so there is a balance between your interest and what people care, right? And uh, so that that's another another thing about how to come up a good research question. Very often, the question or the puzzle you are interested in is people just don't care. Okay, this is something people don't care. And uh, you need to balance between your between your own interests and uh, what people care. Okay, and uh, when you have a question, when you talk to professor. Before, before you talk to a professor, to ask him or her whether this is a good question to answer, you should ask yourself, why should people care? Okay, why should we, for example, like gender inequality, right? When I, tell, when I tell you, okay, the gender wage gap, females are about 20% less than men. And even before I tell you this phenomenon, I already asked myself many times, okay, why should you care this question? Okay, that's why if you pay attention, the way I start this phenomenon is if you look at the world, even across different countries, different ethnic groups, okay, different development, if we look at different countries with different development stages, gender wage gap persists. That's the first reason why people should care, right? It's universal. It's not just in China, or it's not just in US, it's not just in Indonesia or any other specific countries, right? It's, it's almost everywhere. That's the first reason why people should care. The second reason is it's really one dimension of inequality, right? People hate inequality, right? Inequality will discourage people to work hard. Right? And gender inequality is just one dimension of inequality. When talking about the inequality between, for example, in US, people also care care the racial inequality, etc. Right? And so you need to think about many different reasons why people should care. And a good point, starting point to look at the important recent question, you check these papers. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's the the re the goal of doing research in the show run. Okay, now let's specifically take a look at what is a research paper. What is a research paper? And uh, I would like to suggest you to read uh, the uh, to check the Nobel Prize winner in Duflo's website. Okay, and uh, she has many different like uh, intro level introduction about how to do research how to run experiment, which is an important method these days in economics to answer questions I'm going to introduce uh, uh, later on, okay? And um, so what is the research paper? A research paper is applied economics, of course, okay, I, I focus on. So we rely on data. We rely on data, we employ some mathematical methods or econometrics methods, and we use kinds of software theta, r, pi, sum, etc., etc., to answer one single research question, okay? Each paper only has one research question, okay? We don't answer even more. Yes, some people may have two or three research questions, but they are all closely related, okay? We only have one major research question. And uh, yeah, it's not possible for us to answer two or three more research questions in one paper. Okay, and also another suggestion for you. Okay, and uh, when you go to even today, we've already said try to learn the software skills. Okay, theta, r, pi, sum. You are at your golden age to learn all these software software. Okay, and it's extremely important. Even if you. In, in later on or in the future you give up or become an econ professor all these skills are very useful right okay very useful for your future work try to learn these skills and uh, um, 
try to learn them, try to use them to do the, try to learn how to do data analysis. Okay. There are tons of resources out there, okay, online. And uh, so many courses out there. Okay, so that's the, the, the brief overview of our team's research, but let's give me some specific uh, discussions or introduction about what is the research paper. A complete research paper usually has following sections, okay? First is introduction. Introduction usually uh, has like three to five pages, okay? Background. Background, it has like uh, one to two pages. Model section, we may need some theory, okay? Some theory to explain or to answer first, you read the research question in the introduction. And uh, the, in the model or the conceptual, which is called conceptual framework section. And uh, you may have the theory to, in, to explain your, uh, your question and uh, data section to introduce the data you use, results, results to prove or disprove your recent question, and last part is conclusions, okay? And uh, let me give you a brief, um, a, a, a give you an example to explain this. For example, most recently I'm, wor I'm working on a research project on the impact of the state-owned enterprise reform in urban China on gender inequality, okay? So what I'm doing, so the research question is, what's the impact of state on, uh, you have a question? Okay. What's the impact of state on enterprise reform on gender inequality in urban China in 2000? Okay, that's my question. So, I mean, I guess, so many people are not familiar or even don't know what I mean by state-owned enterprise reform, right? People never heard of it. So I need a background section to detailly describe what's, what I'm talking about, the state-owned enterprise reform, okay? So basically, the background is, if you, I don't know whether you know a little bit about China's history. So before 1990s, the, in the urban China, okay? Before 1990s, in the urban China, almost everyone was working in the state-owned sectors. State-owned sectors, like the big, big bank firms, all of these, uh, all, most of these firms were owned by the state or the government, you can think of all the firms. And then because the low efficiency, and uh, in the late 1990s, over 35 million workers were laid off in just uh, four or five years. Less than five years, 35 million workers were laid off. Basically, that's one of the most important events that ever have happened in the urban China. Okay, because of that, and uh, as you can imagine, there was a huge change to the urban areas. And after this reform or layoff, massive layoff, so many private sectors showed up, okay? And uh, so before that, people, when, in, when, when students graduate from college or high school, they were assigned a job, okay? It's kind of like lifetime permanent job, okay? And uh, after that, then people get the freedom to find jobs themselves, blah, blah. So that's a background. So basically, I want to understand this, what's the impact of this huge change on gender, by gender, whether this kind of massive layout, layoff has different impact on females versus males. Exactly, we don't know. Right? So that's why I use a lot of different data sets dated back to 1980s, 1990s to answer this question. Okay? That's a typical framework. Of course, in the model section, I need, so this is a story I just told you. So I need to have some theoretical like, model to back my story. If I believe, okay, this massive layoff, I mean, layoff happen everywhere. Right in different countries, it's just the intensity may differ. Some countries, for example, a typical 
Another example is think about the reunification of Germany, right? And East German, West German uh, before 1990s, it's completely two different, it was completely two different system, right? And after the reunification, the labor market was merged. And uh, yes, there was, there was also some layoff. And I need to borrow some theory to back up why I think this kind of massive layoff may have different impact on females and males. Okay? And it could be it could be differential impact, it could be same effect, I don't know. That's the interesting part of doing research. Okay, we need to uh, figure figure it out. Okay, so that's basically this is a recipe. So if you check the uh, every kind of paper, so you can income paper, so every paper almost has the same sections, okay? And the intro background the model data results conclusions. And the people spend most of the time on the intro. And why? Because usually these days for forever we are becoming less and less patient. Okay? And for the first one or two paragraphs, if you cannot attract people's attention, people will lose the interest. Okay, so usually people spend most of the time on intro. Okay, let me give you some example. Uh, about a research paper, and I think this is quite interesting and important study. Okay, and first of all, if in, this is um, the first page of a research paper, and it's published in AER, okay, 2015. And if the, this is the author, right, this paper has three authors, all of these are uh, three are big names, okay, Duflo, and uh, Nobel Prize winner, Michael Kramer, Nobel Prize winner, the co author. Pass. And uh, let's take a look at uh, the title, okay? Education, HIV, and Early Fertility, Experimental Evidence from Kenya. So by looking at uh, the title, you already know, okay, this paper is about Kenya, right? A poor developing country. And what's the topic of this, of this paper? It's about education, HIV. So, I mean, this is a world we study, okay? Labor economies and um, development economies. Development eco economies, that is poverty, development, okay? HIV, early fertility. So looks like this paper also focuses on the gender issue, early fertility. So basically, this paper, if you look at uh, the title, you know, okay, in Kenya, if you, if you know, like in, in these countries, the early fertility issue is quite prevalent, or early, like child marriage, okay? Girls like girls get married because there yeah, for many reasons at the age 11, 12, or 13. Okay, that's then after they get married, uh, they are going to have birth early fertility and HIV is also quite prevalent. So basically, what the paper does is they went to the authors and the research teams. They went to many different primary and. Um, primary and the middle schools, okay? Primary and the middle schools, what they did is they provide some new courses, some new courses on the importance of the prevention HIV, okay? The, 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 they believe that one important reason for the prevalence of HIV is because people don't even know the existence don't know how it's becoming so prevalent, how people get infected, okay? So they go to, they went to primary schools, they went to middle schools, they educated those kids, okay? And also they educated those kids and tell them the importance about delaying, delaying marriage, they change the curriculum. And the research questions, they want to understand whether this kind of we can say education reform, okay, can change people's attitudes, can eventually change people's, change people's attitudes, change people's behaviors, okay? So, yeah, they just know, so if you look, this is called as an abstract, okay? Abstract will briefly summarize what the, what the, the authors do. So, as you can see, 
This is the uh, HIV's curriculum. Basically, that they design a course. Okay, they did two things. One is HIV curriculum. The the other is education subsidies. Education subsidies. So basically, they give those kids or they give those key uh, students, families, money. Okay, they use money to incentivize those families. You should take care, you should pay extremely attention to the disease. To try to send your kids to go to school instead of just asking them to get married so early. Okay, so they try different uh, type of methods. So they use, so in this paper, in this research, they use experimental method. What is the experiment? So this is also a very fam uh, popular method these days for economists to do research, okay? What people do, so usually in the past, experiment was, con it was conducted in medical science, right? Think about this. So for example, like during, during COVID, right? And uh, the scientists, they develop some new method thing. And uh, they want to test whether the method thing is effective or not, how to do it. They just recruit some volunteers, right? Recruited some volunteers and randomly assign volunteers into treatment group and a control group. They gave the treatment group the new medicine, right? And for the control group, they may just give give them some vitamins, right? And some placebo, placebo medicine. And then after we don't know, a couple of days, and they will compare the treatment control group to see if the treatment group they, who really took the medicine, whether they become better, right? And economists these days, we borrow this kind of experimental method. From, we borrow this kind of experimental method from the uh, medical science, okay? And uh, what we do here is we randomly assign those students into several groups. For one group, they provide us a new curriculum. The other group, okay, for this group, they give the parents some money. And as the last group, they do nothing. Okay, let's compare these three groups. Whether the outcome, what is the outcome? The HIV, the early fertility, all this, whether this have been improved. Okay, so this is what the authors did. Okay, so I'm not going to uh, go details into this, but here I just want to emphasize, okay, and uh, this is the data people usually show or present in the paper. Okay, like I said, the, they give the students, this first group gives students some money, family grant, education, and uh, both education, like the curriculum, curriculum, education, and uh, the money, and the control means they did nothing. And uh, we have four groups, okay? The number here means schools, okay? This is a lot, very large scale experiment. Imagine, think about this. 30, 83 schools, in e almost 80 schools in each group, okay? And uh, yeah, this is like Duflo. She has a huge research team uh, to work for work for her. So I'm not going to go to details. I just want to sh uh, tell you uh, what we have in the paper. Okay, we have tables, we have figures, etc. Okay, and uh, yeah, this is a typical example. And like I said, now I'm a microeconomist. We study families, households, firms, markets. Very like um, micro level um, units, and for macro macro uh, well, uh, macro economy, we study monetary policy, physical policy, financial crisis, financial economy. This is what people usually do. Okay, topics may overlap, but methods are different. Okay, and uh, again, specifically in terms of the topic development. Development studies what? Study poverty. Okay? In the future, when you hear people tell you, okay, I'm a development economist, you should know, okay, this person studies poverty. Folks from developing countries, okay, labor, this is what we're doing. Unemployment, discrimination, education. 
international trade, of course, studies trade, especially like the, the trade relationship between different countries, economics, history. Okay, these days people use a lot of like historical data, like to relate like 100, 200 years ago to today's economic development, urban economics. Urban economics studies, why do we have cities? Okay, basically this is what urban economic studies. Why some air, why some countries have more cities than other countries? What's the advantage of living in cities? Okay, what's the advantage or disadvantage of living in cities? Health economics. And the last one, last one is also what I'm doing. This is quite also quite interesting. So this is a little different from the standard or the classical econ economics and behavior <laughs> economy basic behavior <laughs> economy is assumes that we are not so rational okay why is it rash rationality i mean okay for most of this traditional economy economics we assume we're just uh, individuals we're just like a very sophisticated machine okay we always make a correct choice. But behavior economy suggests that sometimes people can become crazy, okay? Become crazy, we make mistakes, that's an important reason why financial, we have different financial crises in the past several decades, okay? So yeah, that's behavior. Okay, let's take a look at another example. Crime. And the crime is also what we study. And uh, this is also a quite interesting paper, okay? Melissa Dale, so another big name, okay? Melissa Dale, and uh, again, I just briefly introduced trafficking networks and the Mexican drug war, okay? And as you may know, like Mexico is suffered from the really bad drug issues, okay? So basically, this paper studies the drug cartels and uh, he relates uh, the drug the crime activity with the political issue political votings okay and uh, what what he, she studies is that the drug related violence increases substantially after close elections of uh, the city mayors okay so basically Look, if you, if you just read this sentence, our feeling is, wow, why is uh, drug-related violence is so prevalent in many cities, right, in, the, in Mexico since 2007. Looks like this is really uh, related to the political issue, okay? Political issue and uh, basically this is what the author answers. Why is the trade-related violence, the, the drug issue, drug-related violence, increased so much? This is due to the political voting, political uh, party's uh, election. And then it also provides some evidence, okay, explanations to, 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 to support her story, okay? Yeah, this is another example what we study. And the history. History is also this day is quite a hot topic. And uh, this is about China. I don't know whether you heard of the China's civil exam system. The lasted over 1,300 years. And uh, this paper studies the abolition, like uh, the get rid of, abolish, abolishment of the China's civil exam system about uh, one about one two thousand years ago, and basically they just abolished this exam. And what's the result? One consequence is they increase this abo abolishment increases the political stability. What's the underlying story? The claim that so with under the old system, okay, for any individuals. If they want to like move upward, change the social status, they can do what? They can just try to pass the test, right? If you pass the test, 
you can change your whole social status or your family whole family social status. Now, all the door is closed. The door is closed, and you have there is no way for you to move upward to change your family's social status. What can you do? They can do nothing but instead of like participation in the participation in the revolution, participation in the in the social unrest. Okay, so what can you do? So you just protest. Choose to protest. Okay, so I mean, if, think about this. This is uh, this makes sense, but it's not so like easy for people to think of, right? Without the 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 the, the uh, full understanding about China, about the history of China. Okay, uh, let's have a twenty minute short break. Okay, and then we can come back. So let me know if you have any questions. Okay.